Well, good morning and uh, welcome to another teaching. It's a Saturday morning here in Texas and man, it's just a, it's a good day to be in our Bible. It's a good day to be loving on Jesus. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Shout out to, uh, to Jared and, and Jason. Happy birthday. 52 years old today. They're uh, brothers in Christ of mine and uh, blessed birthday, men of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. All right. We're going to begin Romans 12 today, and we're probably just going to do verses one and two. I mean, it is, it's big. I mean, we have, uh, by the mercy of Jesus, we have finished 11 chapters of Romans. It's been incredible. Paul has unpacked theology in these 11 chapters that is nothing short of of world changing. Uh, again, it's been argued that those are the, 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 the greatest 11 chapters ever written on in human history on anything, on any topic, at any time, anywhere. It's, uh, it's amazing. And now as we, as we turn the page, so to speak, over into chapter 12, Paul is going to now, for the remainder of these chapters, right, the last five chapters, he's going to explain to us in, in detail how we ought to live our lives in light of everything that's been done for us, in light of the incredible and overwhelming mercy that's been shown us, that's been unpacked in the first 11 chapters of Romans. It's... Uh, Again, it's 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 remarkable. It's just it's overwhelming, and uh, and hopefully you've been enjoying it. So, wow, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your grace, Father. We thank you for our Bible, Father. We thank you for these first eleven chapters in the Book of Romans, Father, and just the tremendous revelation that's given us in these chapters, Father, and we. We, we thank you, Father, for chapter 12, Lord, and 13, and 14, and 15, and 16. We thank you for the whole book. Father, we ask you to lead us now as we, as we get into the practical application of how to live our lives in light of the incredible mercy that you've shown us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We just thank you, Father, for your word. But, Father, even more than that, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord, and Savior, and Master, and King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life on our behalf that we could never live. We thank you for dying a torturous death on our behalf that we should have died, and we thank you that you're alive and risen today, and we worship you today, Lord Jesus. We worship you, our risen Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. <clears throat> we ask you to give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. Amen and amen. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. So again, um, if you recall that Paul, when he finished chapter 11, he, you know, he gives this, this doxology, this, this hymn, just this explosion of, uh, you know, of just of thankfulness to God. He ends the 11th chapter of Romans. And as we said last time, this could be in response certainly to chapter 11, but, but to everything he's written so far. And right before chapter 12 begins, because obviously remember, right, Scott Paul did not put chapters in. The authors, when they wrote the scriptures, didn't put chapters in. That came in later when, when the Bible was being created, right? So remember in chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, you know, Paul just, ju just, just has almost a spontaneous response to everything that's been said and cries out, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor, who has ever given to God that God should repay him for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so now as we turn over into chapter 12, <clears throat> Paul again now is going to, to give us instructions on how we're to live our lives 
in light of the tremendous knowledge and understanding that's been given to us in the first 11 chapters, in light of all that's been done for us in Christ and how it's been done for us, in light of the tremendous mercy shown us, he says in chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, okay? Now, remember, when you see therefore, you always want to ask yourself, what may? What is it therefore, okay? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Wow. Okay, so if you've spent time in your Bible, if you've read this book before, if you've been in church for any measure of time, then undoubtedly you've heard these verses, okay? Tremendous verses, Nathan, right? So again, the therefore in uh, in verse one, the first word, therefore, Corinne, right? It's, it's in light of not only what's been said in chapter 11, but in light of everything that's been said so far, okay? Therefore, in light of everything that I've said, Paul is saying, in light of everything that's been written, in light of the tremendous revelation given us, therefore, I urge you, brothers. It's it's not a gentle request, okay, right? Urge is the, is the root word of what? Urgent, okay? We, we really are not as Christians, and Father, I ask you to forgive us. We really do not, regrettably, Stephen, have an urgency about us, an urgency to get up in the morning and just begin our day and live our day in and for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There ought to be an urgency in us. And again, Father, I ask you to forgive us. Forgive me, Lord, for, 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 for the vast majority of days where I wake up, Lord, and will often go throughout the day without this, without an urgency to, to live for Jesus. Holy Spirit, I do ask you to convict us one and all, even now, to begin to have a greater urgency in spending time with Jesus, in living for Jesus, in loving for Jesus, in giving for Jesus, and in forgiving for Jesus in everything we do. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, and when he says brothers, obviously he means brothers and sisters here, okay? All those who are in Christ, all those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Paul says, the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul says, therefore I urge you, brothers, brothers and sisters, family of God. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Why do we do it? We don't, and, and this is important. All right, Kristen. All right. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, everything we do, we don't do to get the mercy of God, Jesse. We don't live our lives, Tom, to, to get God's mercy. Okay, we don't strive for his mercy. And you remember what mercy is. Mercy is when we do not get the punishment from our heavenly father that we do deserve. Okay, mercy is when we don't get the punishment that we've earned. Okay, um, and, and I've said this before. I want all of God's attributes. I want all that Jesus has for me. I want his love. I want his grace. I want his mercy. I want his peace, right? I want I want them all. But if I had to choose one, if I could only have one, I think I want his mercy more than anything else. And, you know, it's because we understand how sinful we really are. 
in, in how much we live our lives in, in a way that's that's often not pleasing to our Heavenly Father. When we realize that and the more we realize that and the closer we grow to Christ, the more we really understand how much mercy has been shown us at the cross. That our God, God himself, God the Son, came into this world, right? Out of his tremendous love for us to show us mercy, out of his love. He enters this world. Our God becomes a human man in Jesus Christ, lives a perfect, righteous life in our stead, on our behalf, and on our place, a life we couldn't live. Then goes on to die a torturous death on the cross in our stead, on our behalf, and in our place that we deserve to die and should have rightly died. And then is raised from the dead. And he does all this as, as in, the, in, the, you know, in the providence of our Heavenly Father, that Jesus does all this on behalf of humanity, that, that to all who received him, John 1.12, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, that, that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior now, that perfect righteous life that Jesus lived when he, he came to earth is credited to you as if you lived it. How is that for a mercy? We certainly don't deserve that, right? We don't deserve any of it. We deserve the wrath of God and eternity in hell, the scripture tells us, right? In this very book, right? You remember in chapter, chapter three where Paul explains this wrath of God, right? And in chapter two as well. Um. So again, when you receive Jesus Christ, right? When you put your full trust and reliance and confidence in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul, that perfect righteous life that he lived in thought, word, and deed, never sinned, that life is credited to you. It's accounted to you just like you lived it. God the Father looks at you like you lived that perfect, righteous life that Jesus lived. You didn't, I didn't, but it's credited to, credited to us, accounted to us as if we did live it. And we are seen that we live that life just as Jesus lived that life. How's that for a mercy, okay? But not only that, all the sin we've ever committed in our lives, all the sin in our thoughts, all the sin in our words and the sin in our deeds, all the wrongdoing we've ever done, all of our sin, past, present, and any future sin we commit in this life, that's credited to Jesus at the cross. You see the mercy? That exchange is the very heart of the Christian gospel, right, Lauren? All of my sin credited to Jesus and his perfect righteous life credited to me. Wow. And so when he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, we don't live our lives. We don't do things to get mercy. We've been shown mercy, right? We live our lives in view of God's mercy, understanding and considering, and it ought to be really daily, right? Understanding and considering the tremendous mercy that's been shown us in view of God's mercy, looking at the mercy of God toward us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, thinking about it, Stephen, meditating on it, right? Therefore, I urge you in view of God's mercy, in light of his mercy, knowing the tremendous mercy that's been shown us to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And that word can mean spiritual or reasonable, okay? Um, what does this mean? Okay, so we understand, we're breaking this verse down, right? This verse, you see it? Verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, we talked about that, brothers and sisters, all those who are in Christ in the world for all history, in view of God's mercy, Considering all the mercy and thinking about it and meditating on all the mercy that's been shown us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And you notice again, he says mercy here. Again, 
God's love is, the Bible says God is love in 1 John, right? But it doesn't say in view of God's love. It doesn't say in view of his grace. It doesn't say in, in, in view of his peace. It, you know, it doesn't say in, in view of his generosity. And, and we want all those characteristics, but it's in view of his mercy. Mercy is important because it brings an understanding of our desperate need. It's important to understand why we need mercy. And that's because we are fallen sinful, selfish human beings who desperately need a savior, right? Jesus didn't do all this for us because we were wonderful, well-behaved people, but we were a rebellious people and he has shown us this tremendous mercy. So again, in considering the mercy that's been shown us and thinking about it, okay, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Okay, so what does he mean when he says to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God? Well, when he says bodies here, he means everything, right? Your whole spirit, soul, heart, mind, and body, everything. Your body carries around all those things, right? All those things are wrapped up in your body right now. You get it, right? So, uh, to offer your bodies, your whole being, every aspect of you. I urge you, brothers, there needs to be an urgency about it, a, a conviction about it, right, Chris? To offer your bodies, that's everything you are, spirit, soul, heart, mind, and body, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now, the interesting thing here is we're called to offer every aspect of our lives of our thinking, of our speaking, of our doing, of everything we do in light of all that's been given to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, in light of that mercy, the only response is that we live our days as a sacrifice for Jesus. That's what's reasonable, okay? That's what the mature spiritual Christian is doing, okay? If you're a mature believer in Jesus, Okay, and this is a good test to see where you are in the Christian life. Because remember, we don't get saved by anything we do. We're not forgiven because of anything we've done. Our salvation, our sins being forgiven, being delivered from God's wrath and eternal hell and going to heaven when we die is by God's grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, right? For it is by grace you've been saved, right? It's a gift, right? It's the gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast, right? Um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. <clears throat> but uh, as to grow in Jesus, to, ma to mature in Jesus, that is something we cooperate with, okay? And that process is called sanctification. And sanctification is the process of being transformed, becoming more and more like Jesus, as he's going to talk about in verse 2, and we're going to get to that in a minute here, right? Bam! All right. So uh, the, the urgency, again, in considering all that's been done for us is to offer our bodies. And we talked about that meaning, to, meaning everything, right? Our wills, our hearts, our minds, our choices, our, you know, everything about our physical bodies, our thinking should be offered as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual or, quote, reasonable act of worship. Now, it's interesting because most of us as Christians, and I got to go back and answer the question I just asked, asked us about, you know, where we are in our maturity. Um, but most of us, when we hear the word worship, we think about singing in church. And certainly that's a good thing. We ought to go to church and we ought to, you know, sing good songs and, and, and praise and, and worship our Heavenly Father when we gather together in, in praise and worship, whether it be at church or whether it be in our house or in our car, and that's a good thing. But you notice this has this is worship that has absolutely nothing to do with singing or going to church. Every aspect of your life and my life can be an opportunity of worship to our Heavenly Father, to Jesus Christ our Lord, and to the Holy Spirit. And so... Back to, 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 to the question where I said is, is a good check for you to see, you know, you know, where you are in your Christian walk. Um, 
So when you, when you look at your life, when you look at your day, okay, I mean, how much of your day do you spend in looking to make a sacrifice, right? Or living as a, as a sacrifice, living a sacrificial life for Jesus, right? And most of us, right, Scott, if we were to be candid, if we were to look at our waking hours, we have we have our jobs that we go to, our work that we do, and then we have our hobbies and the fun things we like to do. But if if most of us as Christians were to examine ourselves we, we and do an honest examination, we would come to the point and say, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how much sacrificial living I do for Jesus. And, and this, is, this is a mark. When you have a desire to live your life in a way that's holy and pleasing to your heavenly father by consistently living a sacrificial life. And remember, the very nature of sacrifice is that oftentimes it's something you don't want to do, right? Or it costs you something. That's that's what makes anything a sacrifice, right? I have to sacrifice something, so to speak, right, Pop? Um, you know, for something else. And so in light of everything that's been said in these first uh, 11 chapters of Romans, Paul says this is extremely important, okay? And again, uh, really every one of us could look at this and say, man, I, I'm not doing this by any means in an urgent way, but, but we want to, don't we? This needs to be a bigger and bigger priority to us, right, Rap? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Again, how much of your day are you using your will in your mind, in your thoughts, to live a sacrificial life for Jesus. Again, that's a good examination to see where you are in, in the sanctification process, where you are in maturing in your Christian faith. If you would say, I, you know, I, you know, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, but yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm I hardly spend any time. I may not spend a minute a day, right? I spend very little time offering my spirit, soul, heart, mind, and body, my thinking, my will throughout each day in considering and walking out a sacrificial life for Jesus Christ in, in all of my conversations or wherever I go and with whomever I'm with. And if you would say, you know what, I have very, very little of that, well, then you know that, you know, you're at the beginning of this process and it's something you want to grow in. Now, we're all in different places and this has nothing to do with our salvation or going to heaven. But but this is what Paul calls our spiritual, right? And, and, and spiritual, he often means mature, right? Christian maturity um, or, or reasonable. Okay, the word can also be trans, you know, translated our reasonable act of worship. And, and that's, 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 that's a little easier to understand, right, Becky? Because, I mean, in light of what's been done for us, right, Susan? In light of all that Jesus has done for us, the tremendous mercy shown us at the cross and in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, it is only reasonable for us now to give our lives back to him in, in worship. And by worship here, he means in how we think and how we live and the choices we make that, that, that our desire is to be increasingly holy and pleasing to God. So again, just let this verse wash over you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, what's amazing is, uh, you remember the sacrifices in the Old Testament, when they had the, the sacrificial system that was being used and you'd put a bull on the altar and you'd slit its throat and the blood would, would go down in the bowl. And, and obviously the animal is always, always killed, right? The very nature of the sacrifice is that it's, it's killed, right? So, so we're to be though living sacrifices, right? So, so Jesus has already died in our place, right? He was our sacrifice at the cross. He died in our place, was punished in our place, was judged in our place, right? Uh, the punishment we deserved was put on him. So he was a sacrifice for the sin of the world and the wrath of God was put on Jesus. 
in our place for those of us that have received Christ and are trusting and relying in Jesus as our Savior for those of us that are genuine Christians, right? But now, but now in response to that, we are to be living sacrifices. Jesus died for us as a sacrifice that we might live for him as a sacrifice. Wow, right? That's just, it's real. I mean, again, when you just, when you think about this, when you consider it, when you mull it over, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies. And again, what does your body mean here? It means everything contained in your body, your whole spirit, soul, heart, mind, body, thinking, choices, will, all of it. All of that ought to be a living sacrifice. Jesus died for you sacrificially, and now you and I are to live for him sacrificially in a way that's holy and pleasing to God, to God our Father, our Heavenly Father. This is your spiritual or your reasonable act of worship. And again, when you looked at the word worship here, it kind of, you know, it's a little different than what we you know, what we normally think about when we think about worship. When we think about worship, we're often thinking about church, right? And what we do in church. This is how we live every waking moment can be an act of worship if done in this way. Verse two, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Wow. Okay. So what does this mean now? So now you're consistently looking at the mercy and all that's been done for you at the Christ at, at the cross by Jesus Christ, our Lord, in view of that, with your understanding of that, with that in your mind, you know, remembering the sacrifice Jesus made for you, you're going to be living a, a sacrificial life for him, right? Looking to please your heavenly father and live in a holy way. This is how you're going to worship him throughout your day. How do you do that? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world is just the world system, the way the world goes about doing things. And because we have a sinful nature, we could see we live in a dog eat dog world, right? We live in a world that is, is pulling us to, to, to live in a way that's selfish and self-serving. And it is a battle daily to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, to the, to the world system, to the way the world does things, right? To whether, whether you need to lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, whatever needs to be done, that's what the world teaches us, right? It's about getting all we can for ourselves do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And that word there is, is the word we get uh, metamorphosized, right? Uh, be transformed, right? You can think of a, you've heard the analogy of a caterpillar to a butterfly. And, and you know, when you think of it like that kind of, it's not a very an appealing thing, right? A caterpillar is, can be a little gross, but when it's fully transformed, when it's metamorphosized, right? When it goes through that transformation process, it comes out one of the most elegant creatures ever imagined in a butterfly. And there's no trace of that caterpillar, that, that worm walking around the ground left, right? That's quite the picture for us there, wow. So how do we do this? Do not, be, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. Everything starts with your thinking. It's thinking about Jesus, remembering his mercy, washing yourself in the water of the word of God as you do in these teachings, just remembering the scriptures. Again, thinking about the scriptures, being washed in the water of the word of God, Nathan, right? Golly, just pouring in these scriptures, renewing your mind, thinking about Jesus, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what's the result of that? then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The desire of our heart as we renew our mind will more and more be to want to know what is the heart of Jesus and the will of Jesus in everything we do. What are Jesus' thoughts on his matter? What is Jesus considering? What is the will of Jesus? WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus think? What would Jesus speak? As we renew our mind, as we spend time in the scriptures, as we spend time in praise, 
and, and worship and thanksgiving and repentance, just acknowledging our sin and asking forgiveness and repenting, right? Our mind is renewed, right? Renewed, not thinking about the things of the world, but the things of the word of God and the son of God and the kingdom of God, then you will be able to test and approve. And as we do this, we are transformed. We're maturing. We're becoming more like Jesus. This whole thing gets more exciting and it gets more fun. And in all things and everything we say and do, we want to look for the will of Christ. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Father, that's what we want for our lives. Father, we want to be transformed. Father, we thank you for the tremendous mercy shown us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you. We praise you. Holy Spirit, we ask you now to help us. Help us this day to not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Help us to be conformed, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we will be able to test and approve, Father, what your will is, your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Lord Jesus, we worship you, we thank you, and we praise you now. Holy Spirit, seal this to our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.